Okay, today on the show, we have the infamous one and only George Gammon, real estate investor, entrepreneur, and self-proclaimed macroeconomics addict. And one of the cool things about him is he actually retired when he was 38 years old. And his last business, he grew to $24 million in annual revenue with over 100 employees. I know from having a business, just having three of them is enough uh, of a work. So having 124 million, he's also known as probably, I think the best macroeconomics teacher on the whole internet. And probably what I would say the coolest claim to fame that you have, in my opinion, is when Robert Kiyosaki, as for everyone knows, the number one personal finance, uh, author and teacher in the world, really. And he, and he started using Twitter and he tweeted out, here are the top real money teachers in the world. And it was like all these really cool people, maybe four or five of them. And it was, and it was you, you were like first or second on the list. And so how did that make you feel when you saw that? I'm sure you saw it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Robert's a a great guy and he's become a very good friend, both him and his wife, Kim. So uh, it was an honor to be included in that list. And, um, you know, just to have a guy like that, that I've looked up to for many years, uh, say those kind words, it was definitely something that I'll remember for a long time. So before we get into some interesting things that I I wanted to talk about, how did you go from, like, you have this, I mean, to have Robert Kiyosaki say you're one of the greatest real money teachers in the world. And when you watch your videos, I mean, it's like, this take nine hours for him to map out this video. And, and you have such an amazing understanding of macroeconomics and everything from Bitcoin to gold. Like how did you become who you are today and, and what led you kind of down this, this path? This path. Yeah. Well, I, I think to kind of answer the first part of your question, I have a very obsessive compulsive uh, personality. So for better or for worse, if once I get honed in on something, I'm just all in and I, I completely obsess over it. And that's one reason why I was able to make quite a bit of money. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> it wasn't too good for, uh, well, that's why I made a lot of money and I'm not married and I don't have any kids. <laughs> you get hyper focused on one thing and you kind of go into monk mode, if you will. And uh, if, if you can really, you know, allocate that much energy into something, most likely you're going to do well. So, uh, but unfortunately everything else kind of gets canceled out. When I retired in 2012, when I was 38, I needed to invest my money. I I had a a decent amount saved up, but nothing that could last me the rest of my life. If I wanted to maintain the same lifestyle without getting a good, let's call it 7% return. And the way I was, I just, I trust myself implicitly. And again, maybe that's right or wrong. I'm not sure. I haven't figured it out yet, but I didn't want anyone else managing my money. I'm not a guy that says, oh, I'll just have a financial advisor. And the thought of doing something that everyone else is doing ever since I was a kid just rubs me the wrong way. So I was never going to be that guy that just sets up a 401k or just says, okay, I'll set up this 60-40 portfolio, 60% bonds, 40% stocks, and maybe adjust it by my age, and we'll just set it and forget it because that's what all my friends are doing. I, I always do the complete opposite. That's where I'm most comfortable. So I'm kind of a born contrarian uh, from that standpoint. But I uh, got into guys like Friedman, Milton Friedman, Thomas Sowell, as far as economists, those are definitely my favorites. And I stumbled across Milton Friedman while I was in Singapore at the Marina Bay Sands, just waiting to go to a a dinner date there. Mm -hmm. And it was this free to choose series. And from there, I started studying investors like Jim Rogers and Peter Schiff and Rickards and Druckenmiller and Buffett and all the greats and reading the the Market Wizards books. But I really um, felt a a connection or or the, the way Rogers invests really resonated with me for some reason. So I I said, you know, that makes sense. I'm going to find stuff that's cheap and I'm going to buy it and I'm going to sell it when it gets expensive. And as Jim says, I'm just going to wait for a pile of money sitting in the corner. And when I see it, I'm just going to walk over there and pick it up. That's his investment philosophy. His his words, not mine. (laughs) He said that in in the Market Wizards books way back in the late 80s, early 90s. 
So um, I stumbled across a chart of housing in Japan going back to 1990. And I saw that it had gone down by about 60% peak to trough. And then I saw a chart adjusted for inflation in the United States. Keep in mind, this was 2012. Okay. Uh, what turned out to be the absolute bottom in our real estate crash that uh, you know, peaked out in 2006 and bottomed out in 2012. And adjusted for inflation going back to about 1900, I saw that prices were, were getting cheap. And we went down by about 50%. So I figured, okay, well, it's cheap. The cash flow is cheap. And I can get it at, at rock bottom prices, especially if I'm buying foreclosures from the bank or the short sales or something like that. And my downside looking at Japan was maybe 10%. You know, of course, it was more than that, but that's just the way I was looking. I was very, um, you know, I, I, zero sophistication at the time, to say the least. So I pretty much went all in with real estate in 2012, which turned out to be a, a good decision. And I kept a lot of those in a rental portfolio that I still have today. Although I've started to sell in 2017, 18, hmm. because again, I don't try to predict whether the price is going up or down. I, I don't think I'm, I'm good enough to do that. I, I quite frankly don't think anyone's good enough to do that. The only thing I, I can do is determine if right now it's cheap or it's expensive. And so, uh, you know, back in 2018, let's say, I knew that the prices were starting to get expensive and I didn't, they could double, they could triple, they could quadruple, who knows. But the fact that they're expensive, just based on that one rule, I'm going to start selling. And so I just take that same mentality and apply it to like commodities right now are a great example. We had the crash in uh, March of 2020. So oil went down, as, as, as most people know. So I started buying oil producers and coal producers and uranium back then. And what was ironic there is I felt the prices were still going to go down. But uh, I didn't try to time it. I didn't try to time the bottom. I just knew that right then and there, they were cheap based on my metrics. So even though I thought the prices were still going down, I started to buy. So I, I kind of got that mentality from studying Jim and I kind of uh, owe him a lot of, of my success. In fact, when I interviewed him, he said that I should pay him a, a royalty uh, moving forward. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so then uh, I understood the real estate game. So I made a lot of money as an entrepreneur overseas. So in 2014, it was kind of the gradual progression. I said, well, maybe I can get better returns in South America. So I went back down to uh, Ecuador and Colombia. And at that time, oil was cheap again, but I, I didn't know anything about oil or, or FX, but I knew that the Colombian peso was loosely tied to oil. So if I bought real estate, which is something I knew, it was denominated in Colombian pesos. And therefore, in a roundabout way, it would be kind of an, a, a bet going long oil. And then I figured I'd kind of double the upside and less downside because if I could buy an asset cheap, make money in the buy side, like I knew how to do with real estate, if I could improve it, so force appreciation, get that equity, then if the currency did work out or if oil worked out in my favor, then I'd get double the return. And if it didn't work out in my favor, then I'd hedge my downside because I'd have that cushion with the equity build from a remodel or the cash flow from a rental property. So that's kind of what took me to 2019. Uh, at that time, I had this big team in Medellin, which I still have, that uh, does these real estate. It's, it's kind of like a small business. It's not really investing now. It's kind of morphed into that. But we were doing a lot of these projects. So kind of made sense to do a TV show because I knew they were very popular in the United States. So I figured, well, why wouldn't they be popular in Colombia and in Spanish? And, you know, just kind of going back to my entrepreneurial days where you shoot first and ask questions later. I didn't know Spanish. Uh, I mean, I know a decent, you know, taxis and restaurants, but nowhere near enough to, to be on a TV show. But I went down to the local TV station. I pitched them on it. And I said, listen, I'm the real estate investor. I've got a husband and wife team. They're a young couple, charismatic. They'd be incredible for TV. Joaquin is my architect. Angie's my designer. So the show can be following us around with, while we're remodeling all of my real estate projects here in Medellin. And so long story short, they bought into it. We did a season of that, but I had to produce the show myself. So I hired the editors and the camera people at the end of the first season. This was roughly maybe April, May, something like that. 
and or I'm sorry, no, it would have been June or July in 2019. Uh, at the end of the first season, I had all these great editors and camera people. So I'm like, well, I don't want to lose these people. I don't want to have to lay them off between now and the next season because we got a great team here that we built. So I better find something for them to do. So that took me to YouTube. And the first few videos were on real estate investing because I didn't think anyone in their right mind would ever want to watch a video on macro or uh, you know investing or anything like that or the repo market or the Fed or quantitative easing. But although I really liked real estate investing, my passion was macro. And every single morning, you know, when you wake up, the first thing I do is look at my new podcast and I'd listen to the, the, the latest Peter Schiff podcast, as an example, or Real Vision or Macro Voices, or I'd listen to the audio book. I was in the shower at lunch. It, even when I was going from real estate project to real estate project, I'd have my headphones in listening to uh, just stuff on macro. This is what I did. I go to the gym, same exact thing. And I'd done that since 2012. So I know it's a roundabout way to get to your question, but that's how I kind of learned that is I just was completely obsessed with it from 2012 and I still am. So eight years later. So you kind of build up a, a, a decent understanding <laughs> of how things work. And I'm also the type of person that when I hear something like the, the Euro dollar system, as an example, when I first heard Jeff Snyder talk about the euro dollar system. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. Like euro dollars, what, what, what is that? And so the way I am, I, I, I can't sleep until I figure it out. You know, not literally, but it really bothers me until I, I can figure it out. So you spend a month straight just listening to every single Jeff Snyder interview you possibly can and kind of trying to put the, these pieces of the puzzle together and you just take out the, you know, your, your legal pad and you just sit there and draw everything out on a legal pad and try to figure out, okay, if this is happening over here, okay, I get that, but how does that relate to, you know, if they're creating Euro dollar, um, let's say bank liabilities or deposits outside the United States, how does that affect uh, bank reserves held at the Fed or does it? You know, all these questions that come up and how, how do the dollars get outside the United States? Does there need to be dollars outside of the United States? Well, maybe there does, you know, maybe there doesn't. What if these banking, what if the banks outside the U.S., what if they don't have reserve requirements? You know, well, then do they need dollar denominated reserves to create loans? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. You know, so you, you got to go through the whole thing and answer all these questions in your own mind until it makes sense. And then by the time it makes sense, then it's actually pretty easy. To, <laughs> to, well, it's not easy, but then it's a lot easier to go to a whiteboard, draw it up there and just explain to a camera exactly what you've been um, obsessing over for the last month. And that's kind of uh, how I, I do the videos. It's, it's not really anything where I, I pull the community to see what they're interested in. Every once in a while, I'll see like a hot topic, you know, when the market's crashing or the repo is spiking or something. And I'll do videos on that because I'm interested in it, really. Uh, but for the most part, I just, uh, whatever I'm thinking about at the time during that week, uh, that's pretty much what I do the whiteboard videos on. And uh, with the YouTube channel, those, thank, you know, thank goodness, those were very, very popular. And the real estate uh, videos weren't, that popular at all. So it just worked out well because that's what I like talking about anyway. So that's kind of how we got to where we are today. Interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. I it's always something, and I think for most people, you hear everyone, at, ex someone like you explain these, you know, really magnificent things in a way that helps your average investor or individual, but it's cool to hear the whole story. So on macro, let me ask you, uh, did you ever think out of all your studying and all of your, all of your years as an entrepreneur and all the amazing things you've learned, did you ever think we'd be in the situation that we find ourselves in, in not only of course the, the American economy, but the global economy right now? Did you ever no. think we'd be in a situation like this? No, no, not, not just from an economic standpoint, but maybe even more so from a social standpoint. I mean, if you would have, you know, I was doing, um, I did the first corona, my first coronavirus video back in January, actually, of 2019, when uh, at that time, everyone was accusing me of wearing a tinfoil hat and, oh, you're, you're just waving this red flag for no reason. 
if you're a conspiracy theorist and all these things. And I'm like, no, guys, just you need to pay attention to this. You know, it might not be too big of a deal, but you, you got to pay attention to it. Look at these numbers, you know, look at the the, the, the R not value or whatever. But now it's it's the complete opposite. I'm saying, okay, guys, you, you we all get it, but now we've gone way, way, way too far to where this is really infringing on our on our personal liberties. So um, you know, I, I'm not here to debate how how severe it is, whether it's more severe or less severe than the flu. But what I do know definitively is that uh, governments should not be dictating whether or not we're allowed to go out of our house or, uh, you know, if we go outside, if we have to wear a mask or if we can open or, or close our business, that, that, that is not up to a government. You know, I always felt as though the government should just give us the data and then let us make our own decisions as adults, for heaven's sakes. I, I don't need a nanny state to tell me what I can and can't do and what's best for me and my family or for that matter, my business. So I never thought uh, I would ever see government shutdowns and lockdowns like we've seen. But um, I, I guess going back to the economic part of the question, did I ever think that the Fed would uh, be at seven trillion? I, I guess, I think yes, I, I did, but I didn't think it would happen this fast. So I, you know, once they, I completely agree with Schiff, and once they started quantitative easing, it was pretty obvious that there was no going back. Like once you go down this path, it's just like drugs. That's the best example. You know, you can take start taking heroin or cocaine or whatever it is, and you just have to add more and more and more and more and more to get the same effect. And quantitative easing uh, is or artificially low interest rates is the exact same thing. It's it's the exact same thing. And unfortunately, now we're at over seven trillion on the Fed's balance sheet. And um, you know, we saw what happens once they try to unwind that balance sheet, once they try to go back to, let's say, normal. You know, their balance sheet before 2008 was right around 800 million. And through the three rounds of quantitative easing, it got up to uh, 4.5 trillion. And then they tried to do what they call quantitative tightening, which is sell some of those bonds and pull back some of that uh, base money supply, those bank reserves, and everything collapses. And <laughs> they got a, and the repo spikes up to ten percent, and all these things. And then they got to say, "Whoa, time out. Okay, that didn't work out too well. Now we've got to go back and start this quantitative easing again." And sure enough, now we're over seven trillion. And uh, I think the exact same thing would happen, if not worse, now because you see, once it again going back to the the, the drug user analogy, it's like that person that that you know if they need more and more drugs. To have the same effect, their their body is becoming more and more dependent on those drugs, and just and that's the same thing our economy is doing right now. Our economy is becoming more and more dependent upon uh, you know the Fed creating more bank reserves or, or printing money, if you want to call it that, taking their balance sheet up, uh, artificially low interest rates, just um, you know quantitative easing. It's it's. It, 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 there's only one way to go. And, and that's just more and more and more until the whole system collapses. Now, again, I didn't think it would happen this fast, but I knew that uh, eventually you got to get to that end game. Yeah. So one of the things that I'm really always been infatuated with was the future. And a lot of these things that I, you know, before you and I were on air, I was talking about when I was a freshman in college and I kind of, my dad helped me wake up and taught me how the monetary system works and a lot of other things. And before I dropped out, when I would sit around on at the time, obviously the YouTube collection was a lot smaller, but documentaries, books, <laughs> it was things that every person thought I literally had a psychotic break, you know, and you look across the board at these things, you know, back then that was, you know, cashless, uh, digital society that the monetary system is controlled by basically a one world government. And you, you're actually seeing these things start to um, happen. And so I want to ask you earlier, you said that you never thought that we would have such an infringement of, of rights. And then you said just a moment ago that you never thought that the monetary system would appear to be falling apart this quickly and this early. I, 
at, at, at a time. You thought maybe something later down the road. Where do you think that this is going? And I also want to talk a little bit about some of the videos and content you put out on on um, monetary reset and cashless society and banned cash. But you know, maybe you could touch on that. We could go into those specifics. But as a whole, where do you see this playing out, right? This is a question a lot of people don't want to ask, right? Because it's so daunting. They prefer the question is an ask. But, you know, normally I talk to people, a lot of my interviews, maybe they're more about investments and stuff, but you're probably as deep diver and, and, um, and in the know and studying as, as much as anyone. And I'm just genuinely curious, where does this go? Well, more. So what the Fed's doing right now just going back to that uh, that drug addict analogy, they're just going to have to do more. They're going to have to do more quantitative easing. They're going to have to do more. So what that means is they're going to have to continue to increase the size of their balance sheet. So whether that's taking it to 10 trillion, 20 trillion, the, the debt of the United States is also just going to go up. So I think understanding that those are as close to a 100% probability as we can get. Again, there are no certainties. It's just a matter of, of, of figuring out the probabilities, but say that's at a 90% probability. Then you've got to ask yourself, okay, what does that mean for the economy? What does that mean for the stock market? What does that mean for the housing market? What does that mean for interest rates? What does that mean if the Fed's balance sheet goes to 10 trillion, uh, 20 trillion? You know, what does that mean if the Fed's, or what are the knock-on effects if the Fed's balance sheet is at 20 trillion and the US debt is at, call it 50 trillion, you know, double where it is today. Uh, the debt to GDP ratio is 250%, that's on balance sheet. You know, what happens then? And then what is the transfer mechanism, right? So if, if, the, if the Fed does take their balance sheet to let's say 20 trillion, okay, do they do that by just the same mechanism that they're using now, meaning that they're just creating bank reserves, because that doesn't necessarily create consumer price inflation, because those bank reserves don't just get immediately injected into the, the real economy. Usually what would happen is it would just increase the, the balance sheet capacity of the commercial banking system. And so in, in, in normal human words, <laughs> what that means is it just gives the, the banks the ability to create more loans. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they do. You see, they have to have a, a profitable loan to actually create. Or they have, or the, you know, most people also forget about the demand side of the equation, right? They say, okay, well, we got rid of reserve requirements for the bank, so now they can just lend a, a quadrillion dollars. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, technically that's true, but they need to find people who actually want to take out loans for a quadrillion dollars. <laughs> We, we just we always look at the the supply side with lending and we, we rarely look at the demand side and if the the general consumer out there is just maxed out to where their income isn't increasing and yes you can take interest rates down lower and lower and lower so their payments go down relative to their income but at a certain point you can't take them any further unless we go to a, a cashless society and we can touch on that in a bit so it, so I just went through kind of like a, a mental experiment there saying, okay, what's well, at 20 trillion, but if we're confined by the same system we have now, maybe that creates inflation, maybe it doesn't create uh, consumer price inflation. But if we move to a different type of system where the Fed can circumnavigate the commercial banking system, so they don't need the commercial banks to create loans, to create additional money supply, in the real economy, chasing those goods and services. So, and this goes back to a cashless society, digital uh, government backed currency type thing. Then all of a sudden, if you're saying, okay, now they're taking the balance sheet to 10 from 10 or seven to 20 with that new direct transfer mechanism. Now all of a sudden, okay, we go from, is it gonna be deflation? Is it gonna be inflation? Like what type of deleveraging are we gonna have? Now there's a 95% probability that it's going to be inflation, right? And that then you say, okay, well, I, I get that. Well, then how does the government play into this? Well, we know that if the government spends money, they have to get it from somewhere. 
So if they're getting it from the, the, the private sector, then they're, they're taking money out of the private sector just to spend it right back in. So it's kind of just a, a net wash. But what's happening is if the Fed is monetizing the debt, and a lot of people hear this, but they might not understand what that means. That just means that basically the Fed is buying the, the, the debt directly from the treasury. And there is a shell game there. So legally, they can't really do that, but it's all just nonsense. What happens is the primary dealer banks buy the treasuries at auction first. And then like 20 minutes later, they just flip it to the Fed and the Fed pays them. So, so the Fed isn't technically buying it directly from the treasury, but that's the, the, the net result, right? Okay. So, then what's hap- so then you ask the question, well, where is the Fed getting the money to buy these treasuries? Well, they're just creating more bank reserves. So if they're just creating more bank reserves, then that's not then that isn't sucking out any dollars or any liquidity from the real economy. The only thing that's happening is they're just spending more dollars into the real economy. You see? Hmm. So if the Fed is monetizing the debt, then that's going to increase the deposits in the real economy with the commercial banking system. The more deposits there are, technically, the more purchasing power you have that's chasing the same amount of goods or services. Hmm. And then if velocity stays the same, meaning how fast those currency units circulate within the economy, then you you have to get price inflation. So what we did there is we just kind of walked through a thought experiment to say, okay, well, if this happens, then that would probably happen, then that would probably happen. And I think that uh, if you start by understanding that the, the Fed and is most likely going to take their balance sheet up, and again, who knows how fast it'll get there, but it's got to keep going up. And, and it, there's a 90% probability, let's say that happens, and then you assume that there's a 90% probability that the government will continue to have to have to run deficits because again, it's that it's, it's our economy has become addicted to government spending and the fed creating all of this, what I call funny money, these, these bank reserves and lowering interest rates. And so we can't go back, right? It it causes to, well, we could, but it would cause a, a massive amount of pain. And I don't think that's politically palatable for a politician because they know there's no way they're ever going to get reelected. And uh, I don't think we have, I don't think, you know, there's individuals out there that would like that and would just kind of tighten the belt buckle and whatnot. But I think as a society at large, we're not willing to do what is required to kind of hit the reset button and go back and start building from a solid foundation. We're just going to keep using more and more and more drugs, right? And that's why we need that deleveraging that I was referring to earlier. But I, I think that my main point is if you look at the, the probability being very high that the Fed's going to increase their balance sheet, keep doing so, and the government's going to increase government spending and deficit spending, then you can start to kind of plug that into your own equation to figure out what the probabilities are that X or Y happens. But, it, but it's always a moving target, right? Because the system could change. Like, Prior to, to COVID, you never, ever would have imagined that the Fed would just set up uh, special purpose vehicles to buy corporate debt and to buy junk debt. Because Why? Because that's completely uh, antithetical, antithetical to the Federal Reserve Act. That the, the Federal Reserve Act doesn't allow them to go buy corporate debt, right? So you'd say, okay, well, if, if we're living within the confines of the Federal Reserve Act, then there's no way they can do this, but they did. So when they do that, then you have to readjust your thinking and then you have to readjust your probabilities. Fascinating. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you probably get it a lot because, especially because you make so many macro videos, but there's a lot of people that that basically would just say you're going to get a brain hernia by thinking this deep. Nothing's really changed significantly at all. (laughs) This is going to keep going this way. What's your response to somebody that basically says, yeah, you're probably right in theory and maybe things will happen, but you know, you should, uh, you know, go outside and drink a beer and turn the TV on and chill out a little bit because there, we haven't had this inflation that the Peter Schiffs have been saying, you know, you're going to walk around with a wheelbarrow full of money soon. And 
these things haven't happened. Right. And what's your, what's your response to that? Well, they never happen until they do happen. Hmm. And I mean, a lot of my employees in Colombia are from Venezuela. Hmm. And I mean, if you think back to the beginning of the Hugo Chavez days, when uh, Venezuela was, was very near to the richest country in South America, and this is early 2000s. I mean, think about how many people there were warning when Chavez got into power that this is not going to end well. If you socialize all of these, uh, let's say the oil companies or the oil industry, and if you start just giving handouts and turn this into a welfare state, and if you base the entire economy just on one thing, and that's oil, you're, you're at some point in time, the price of oil is going to go down and you're going to be leveraged to the hilt and you're going to have to pay the fiddler. And just, I mean, you could have said the exact same thing. In fact, I'm sure people were saying the exact same thing. Yeah. Oh, just go outside and have a beer. Don't worry about it. You know, we haven't seen it yet. You keep talking about this hyperinflation and we haven't seen it here. And Chavez is great. And don't worry about it. The price of oil is just going to go up and just chill out a little bit. Well, that's fine. Uh, you know, we're not going to have hyperinflation until you get hyperinflation. And it's the exact same thing with, uh, you know, the stock market in the United States in 2009 or 2008, right? Oh yeah, don't worry about it. Or the housing market. It's another great example of that. Oh, don't, uh, don't worry about it. The housing prices always go up. You're just uh, a naysayer. You're just, uh, you know, you're just, you're, you're fear mongering. Yeah. You're just, uh, you know, blowing the whistle for no reason whatsoever. Just, uh, you know, buy a house and enjoy the profits. You know, keep flipping those houses. Just don't worry about it. We've never seen real estate prices go down. So, you know, they don't go down until they go down. And it, it's a, it, again, it's a matter of probabilities, right? And when I first got into to business and became an entrepreneur, one of the things that I did just as kind of a hobby was play blackjack. And so I, I learned how to count cards and I taught myself and same thing there. I would obsess over it when I wasn't working. I'd go straight to the casino and just literally play eight hours straight to where the, the employees just could not believe I could sit at one table that long. And, um, and then I was just practicing basic strategy. So I wasn't even counting cards. I was just trying to train my brain to, to think in terms of probabilities. But it's the same thing as if you go and play blackjack with one of your buddies and you're there having some drinks and uh, you know, you're telling them that this is a game of probabilities and they're saying, oh, shut up, I don't wanna hear it. I just wanna enjoy myself. Why do you always have to be a downer and let me just do my shot of whiskey? And then let's say they get a 19 and you tell them, hey, and they're like, well, I think I'm going to hit on this 19. And you're like, oh, whoa, whoa, time out. You know, I, again, I don't want to be a downer, but that's not a good idea to hit on a 19. The probabilities are, are really, really against you. You should not do that. Oh, shut up, George. You just go, you know, go talk to someone else. Leave me alone. I'm going to go ahead and hit. So they hit and they get a 21. Right. And then, of course, what do they do? They turn around to you and say, oh, see, you were wrong. If I would have listened to you, I never would have got this blackjack. Yeah, fair enough. But if you continue to do that in the, in the long run, we all know what's going to happen. You're going to go bust. So that's how I kind of answer that question. If you want to ignore probabilities, if you want to ignore what's going around or what's going on around you, if you want to just whistle by the graveyard, that's fine. And hopefully you'll be able to get out before it all comes crashing down. But why take that risk, right? Why not just be cognizant of it and set up and set up your portfolio so you can make money regardless of what happens. And then if and when it does happen, then you're prepared. I say I always say this, and I say it to Kiyosaki all the time. I say, listen, you, you got to be prepared, or you're going to be a victim. Those are your two choices. There, there are no other choices than that. Yeah, that's interesting. So I want to ask you a little bit about investing and a little bit about uh, a business. But one of the things that I thought was really interesting when I was looking at uh, your work was there's a lot of people when they hear the term of this idea of 
a digital money or a war on cash or banning cash and they want to attack it to do this digital thing. If you don't think about it much, it really does just sound like a ridiculous conspiracy theory idea because you don't understand the uh, actual rational steps as to why it's actually a necessity from their eyes in our way our monetary system is going. And I found it really, I mean, incredible. I think it really is an incredible work to humanity was your, your videos on war on cash. And I don't say that lightly because you explain it in such a important to understand way as to why they would actually want to do it. And you talk a lot about the intricacies of what it would look like, why they would do it, how it would affect this and that. And I was hoping you would go a little bit into that. Why a war on cash? Why a ban on cash? And why would or are they moving towards a digital dollar? If anybody was paying attention, you saw in the first stimulus package that was rejected, the very first one of the coronavirus, the digital dollar was in it. It was in uh, a first draft that was rejected. So why would they want that? What are the benefits of it from their eyes? The war on cash, if, if you could go into it a little bit for, for someone to understand in a really amazing way that you illustrate. Yeah, it's, it's really taking the opposite side of it and say, why wouldn't they want it? I, I mean, it gives them just limitless power. And we all know that's what politicians are all about. You know, you got, you got to think about what it takes to be a good politician. You just have to be power hungry. You have to be willing to lie. Uh, it's just like the best liar wins. It's the person with the least amount of uh, ethics wins. You know, the person with, uh, with no moral compass whatsoever, they're the one that, that wins with no principles or, or you know, it, it's, it's the bottom of the barrel. So these people, they're there because they want power and a digital currency gives them just almost limitless power. Uh, going back to, you know, if people want proof of this, just Google Banking for All Act. I just did a video on it. And it just, there was a, a, a senator or whatever that proposed this, and this was back in March. And it talks about the digital dollar, the digital wallet, and us all having accounts with the Fed. So the main thing that this allows them to do is to, know every single transaction. So if you and I both had an account with, with the Fed, just like the primary dealer banks, then they would basically have our bank statements. So every single transaction of every American within the domestic economy, or if they're moving money outside the economy or any business, the, the Fed would have, or the government, would have a record of that. So they can see what's happening when. That's number one. Number two, is it would allow them to take rates negative. So in, in their, with their models, they think that the way that you stimulate an economy is just lower interest rates. So if, if the economy isn't working or isn't functioning properly, and uh, you, or if you're not getting inflation, then they think there's excess capacity in the system. And therefore there needs to be increased demand, increased aggregate demand, and the way you do that is by taking interest rates lower. And if they've already hit the zero bound, they've got the zero lower bound, then, well, then you just didn't take them low enough. And you just need to take them to negative two. And if that doesn't create inflation, well, you just didn't take them low enough. Then, you know, you need to take them to negative five, negative 10. At no point in time do they ever look at the model and kind of scratch their head and say, hmm, I wonder if this doesn't work. <laughs> that never that never crosses their mind. You know, they look at Japan, they look at Europe and like, hmm, they've been trying this stuff for decades and they haven't gotten inflation. Maybe it doesn't work. No, 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 no. The conclusion that they draw is, well, they just didn't do enough. Right. So how do you do enough? Well, you'd have to be able to take rates negative. And at a certain point, you know, you might be able to take them negative 20 basis points or maybe negative 100 even or negative 1%. But you take them negative 5, 10, 20, and obviously no one is going to put their money in the bank. There, there's absolutely no, no way. So they would have a run on deposits and that would create a lot of problems. So, but if there's no cash, if you can't take your money out of the banking system, 
then they could take him as far negative as they, as they want. And another problem that, they're, that they know they're going to have is through tax receipts. So if you assume that the government's deficits are going to increase and we're going to go to, you know, who knows, 50, 50 trillion, who knows where we'll, we'll stop next as far as the, uh, the government debt. And I'd like to remind everyone also that this year we'll have near a $5 trillion deficit. So people say, okay, well, what does that mean, George? Well, in the first 220 years of our country's existence, from 1776 to 1996, we accumulated about $5 trillion in debt. And we're going to accumulate that much debt just this year. Oh. Just this year alone. So to say the government is going to have a hard time paying that debt or without creating inflation, because the MMT people are gonna yell at me right there and say, oh, they can pay the debt, they're the currency issuer, you rube. They can pay it, you know, they're not restricted by, uh, by you know, having to collect dollars before they can spend them because they issue the currency itself. Okay, but it all goes back to inflation. Even Kelton and Mosler say, and they're kind of the, the, the grandfather and grandmother, if you will, of, of the modern MMT kind of uh, narrative, they would even admit that your constraint is inflation. So I'll just, I'll, I'll preface with that. But uh, so the only way they can get there is it, it, without just monetizing 100% of the debt, it, which would likely create inflation, is to collect higher taxes. Okay, well, the problem with that is, uh, and, and most people just come right in and say, okay, that's fine. Well, the rich need to pay their fair share and you just need to uh, increase you know, the corporate tax rate, uh, we should be paying what Sweden is paying or something like that. But what they don't realize is if you look at the tax receipts as a percentage of GDP, it never changes. Hmm. So you can go back, you go back to the 1940s, or the 1950s or 60s or 70s or whatever, when you had that highest marginal rate at call it 60, 70, 80%. And the tax receipts as a percentage of GDP were still right around 18%. Hmm. The exact same thing, the exact same amount of tax revenue was collected in the mid or late 80s when we had like a 25 or 27% highest hmm. marginal tax rate. And I, I think that the, the people, not that there's any politicians or people at the Fed that are that intelligent, but if there are, I think they look at this and say, okay, wait a minute, just jacking taxes up to 80% isn't the answer because people won't pay the taxes. That's just clear. They'll find ways not to pay those taxes. So therefore, uh, we have to have some sort of system to where we can take the taxes in advance or people can't move their money around to get out of the system to where if we did raise tax rates to 80%, we could just take it straight out of people's accounts. They would have no, they would have no control over it. Hmm. Or what I think they might do is they might just make you prepay it. So every single time that you take uh, and spend money, that they take a percentage of the amount. And then at the end of the year, when you file your taxes, they say, okay, well, you've paid $200,000 in tax because that's 10% out of, of everything that came out of your account. What do you owe us? You know, now, now we'll go ahead and, and, and settle up or something like that. And you're just at the mercy of the IRS to determine, you know, whether they think you should pay X or, or, or Y. And um, if anyone thinks that the IRS takes what they should collect based on your actual tax rate, you're kidding yourself. You've never been audited. I can promise you that. I've been audited five times. And, uh, and when push comes to shove, the IRS just makes you pay whatever they want you to pay. <laughs> it's not about right or wrong or dotting your I's and crossing your T's. So just, just forget about that. But my point is having the uh, digital currency and a, a cash ban, you would lock everyone into this system to where their purchasing power had to circulate within the, within the system and the Fed and the government would have total control over that. So uh, again, you've got them just having limitless amounts of power. It, they're, they have the ability to take rates negative, <clears throat> excuse me. This creates a huge amount of data. So we'll start in order, huge amounts of data, negative interest rates, 
and they can collect any amount of tax that they want. Uh, they could also kind of finagle how the money is spent. So they could say that um, if they want to prop up the uh, green energy or maybe electric vehicles, something like that, they could just immediately flip a switch because it's all code. Really, at the end of the day, it's all code. So they could say, okay, last year we had, uh, we'll just call it uh, $100 billion were spent on vehicles in the United States. It's taking a, a number right off the top of my head. And they could say, okay, next year what we're going to do is we, uh, well, assuming we have the same $100 billion that's spent, 75 of it has to be spent on electric vehicles. And you say, well, how, how could they make you do that? Well, easy because your money is right with the Fed. And then of course the merchants that are collecting the money and the banks, they're all with the Fed. It's all under the same ecosystem. So they could control exactly where that money is going. Or if you did something that they deem as wrong, right? Let's say you, you, you went outside or you were caught on one of these street cameras without wearing a mask. And then let's say that that's the local law. Well, you could just, they could just take that fine immediately out of your account because you're caught on, on the picture and you just go to check your balance and it's less a thousand dollars or they could freeze your account if they didn't like what you're doing. Let's say that you posted something on Facebook that they deem as inappropriate. Okay. Well, they just freeze your account and you're locked out. You can't get any money. You can't get uh, no zero cash. You, you're just, so you see, this is the control that I'm talking about that it would give them. And I don't think that any politician can resist that. And that's why I th I'm very confident, again, not 100% certain, but I'm very confident that, that we'll continue to go this direction. And lastly, I think you have to look at kind of the global elite. And, and like I've always talked about these uh, people at the World Economic Forum, uh, but it's the, the global elite, you know, you hear their narrative and it's all just based in Marxism and socialism. And it may, you know, they may call it different things, but you, you see what their objectives are. They're right there on their website. And it's very consistent with um, maybe not socialism or Marxism the way we know it, but it's, it's very consistent with anti-free market capitalism uh, to, to the point where they'll say, you know, we need to move away from what they call neoliberalism, which is basically just what normal human beings think would be perfect. And that's where the government leaves you alone. We have private property rights. We have low regulations, low taxes. <laughs> Basically what we had in the late 1880s or uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s, you know, when the economy was really booming in relative terms or in real terms. And what most people would think, okay, yeah, I like that. That, that sounds like free market capitalism. That sounds like what we're all about here in the United States. You know, they're trying to move us away from that. So the next question in my mind becomes, okay, well, if they're trying to move to a more centrally planned economy, global economy, they, they, they're, they've got to be smart enough to know why that didn't work in areas like Russia. Like, why did communism fail? Well, the main reason, there are several reasons, but one of the main reasons it failed is because there was, there was no price discovery. So if there's no prices, then you, there's no demand, you know, from the bottoms up, with individuals making decisions on a daily basis on what's best for them and their families, then you can't allocate resources because you don't know where that this, this steel should go. You don't know where its highest use case is because there's no prices to, to tell you that because typically if there's the high, if there's a higher use case for this steel, let's say in Texas, than there is in uh, North Dakota, then the prices of steel will go up in Texas. And that price signal tells you, okay, that the, the steel producer needs to allocate more resources to the, where the price is going up. So, so, so limited resources with alternative uses get allocated in a very efficient manner. But without those prices, they get wasted. And if you continue to waste your scarce resources as a country, that doesn't last very long. You know, and that's why they had famine. That's why they had all the, these problems. So I think that the, the globalists and the people who are pushing us away from 
neoliberalism, which is just basically free market capitalism. Uh, they, I think they get this. And I think maybe, and this is just a total hypothesis, I have, I have no proof for this whatsoever other than not just kind of thinking it through in my own mind. And, you know, maybe they're looking at AI as a way to solve the problem. So if you had, and that's why I go back to big data, that's why I started with big data, because if you have everyone's account at the Fed, and therefore they're, they're, they're collecting data on every single transaction in the United States, everyone, so we're talking about billions of transactions daily, and they could just take this AI, then the AI, in their minds, would be able to allocate those scarce resources just as well as a free market capitalist economy could, because you wouldn't need price discovery because you'd have the AI. And then you'd have enough data coming in so the AI could, could learn and could do its, its job. You know, they're saying this, not me. <laughs> right? So then that's, that, that kind of solves their problem. They're like, okay, well now, it, if we can get this price discovery out of the way where we don't need this, and we can allocate those resources maybe even more efficiently than a free market capitalist society could. Now, done deal. We can move closer and closer to this socialist utopia that's all centrally planned without having to you know, have any of the downside of what communism used to be. And so I think and again, this part of the equation, I have no proof for. It's just me kind of, you know, brainstorming. And I did a video on it the other day. A lot of the other stuff we talked about, there's proof right there on the internet, the, the website, like the Banking for All Act. You can just check that out. So I, I want to make sure that people understand and compartmentalize the two ideas. But I think that's why the big data could be so important. But as far as the power, the negative interest rates and the taxes, that that's, I think, obvious. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, number one, by then I'm going to have a hundred acre farm with an electromagnetic force field that will actually <laughs> disintegrate anybody that comes into this. So that's number one. Number two is we might need you to shut your YouTube account down because you thought about this stuff so much. They might actually be going to your channel to figure out their, their plan. Well, so the BBC we might- did a hit piece on me. They did? Yeah. Uh-oh. So what happened is the first, uh, video I, I, did exploring this, or I call it is the, the great reset. And yeah. uh, ironically enough, the people at the World Economic Forum, that those are their words, not mine. Yeah, They're I watched all the stuff too, all, all the same things that you talk about. I'd seen it all. Yeah, you can go to their YouTube channel and just type in World Economic Forum Great Reset and you'll see their videos. It's I'm not making it up or I'm not editing it. And ironically, the almost the entire video that I did, I just took it straight from their website. And I just basically explained just the diagrams that they have right there. And of course, the, about a month later, or I don't know when it was, uh, the BBC does this hit piece. I wasn't the only one included, but they, they included me on this hit piece on misinformation on YouTube and how you better not listen to these guys because they'll brainwash you and they'll take you down this rabbit hole to where you, you won't be making decisions with your own cognitive ability. You know, they'll manipulate you into believing all these crazy conspiracy theories when I don't think they even did enough homework to realize that uh, the video they used of mine as an example of this misinformation was directly from their, the World Economic Forum's website. So um, they're already, I think, they, and now is there any relationship between the people at the World Economic Forum and the BBC? I'll let you decide. If you have any sense, the answer is yes. All you got to do is a tad bit of research. So let me ask you, so in, in, and this is what I'm really interested in, really what I wanted to talk to you about was all, all about the future. And, and, and um, but let me ask you, so what you were sharing was like so detailed. And first of all, before I say that, one thing that I do want to say that I really appreciate about you is there's a lot of people that talk about this type of stuff and they're very angry and they're very upset. And, um, and, it's, and it's nice to have someone who's teaching so many people of these important things and is still able to stay lighthearted. So I, I, uh, I know I'm sure many people appreciate that as well. Um, but let me ask you, so what you're talking about in so much depth of all these things and coding and, and, 
uh, digital dollar in a, in a Fed wallet that pulls the money and the taxes out. It seems like that would take a long time to create. You have no way maybe to necessarily uh, say yes or no to this other than your own opinion. Do you think that these types of things are already being created? Because when I hear that, I go, shit, that might take 9,000 years to build. Do you think that these things are already being, being worked on? Um, obviously we know that they've thrown around this idea of a digital dollar, but do you think they have a black budget, um, $10 trillion black budget situation with a bunch of coders that Jack Dorsey pulls out to go work for them that are building these things right now? Or do you think this is purely conceptual and they're just saying, Hey, let's do this fed wallet idea. Or in your opinion, is this something that behind the scenes on a, on a, uh, on a uh, agency we know nothing about that's being built? Well, I don't know that you'd have to build a lot of it to hmm. achieve their objectives. Now, let, let's shelf the AI stuff and the whole, right. you know, what we're talking about. Yeah, let's about. talk about the earlier stuff on the monetary. And yeah, that, that, I mean, who knows? I mean, I'm not an AI person. I, I have no idea if Makes sense. private sector, they have uh, th that type of technology already, or if that's years, down the road. I, I, have, I have no clue, so I couldn't comment on that. But as far as, uh, you know, banning cash and then moving to this digital dollar, I don't think that would be hard at all because oh. the Fed already has the ability to have accounts because the primary dealer banks have accounts and there's a lot of other banks that have accounts with the Fed right now. So that wouldn't be difficult. Oh. Uh, then it, obviously they, they'd probably have to staff up quite a bit if, if there was 300 million of these accounts. But uh, I think that that's doable. And then, you know, they can already create bank reserves. That, that's not a, a, a technological challenge. They just go to a keyboard and type in more numbers into a XYZ bank account. So that's super easy to do. Hmm. Then it's about, okay, well, how would you as an American be able to spend the money that the Fed was putting into your account? So they'd be putting bank reserves into your account but then you could take and spend those bank reserves as though it was legal tender. So I, I, again, I, it, it's just all code. So I think that they just set up the, the, the merchants to where they have a, a little machine. Yeah, I mean, you see them in Starbucks, you just run Apple Pay or, right. anything, or Google Pay, and it's pretty much the same type of thing where it just scans it and they have, they, the business has an account with the Fed as well, remember that. So it's just a transaction that's happening between one account at the Fed and the other account with the Fed. And, and keep in mind, the same thing happens now, right? And so let, let's maybe back up and, and, and walk through this a little bit here. And I don't think most people really have connected these dots. But so if you go down to Starbucks right now, and let's say Starbucks, the, the local Starbucks has an account with Wells Fargo. And that's their business account. And let's say you have an account with a personal account with Bank of America. And you go down and you buy your, your $5 coffee from, uh, from Starbucks. So, so what happens in that transaction? So, well, there's a couple things that happen. The, the deposit, the $5 that is a deposit of yours or liability of the commercial banking system is, is moved from your account at, at Bank of America to Starbucks account. And of course, they have to batch and do all these things. But, but the, the net result is that that $5 of deposit or, more importantly, a liability of the commercial banking system, because that's what a deposit is, it moves from B of A, your account with B of A, to Starbucks account with Wells Fargo. But, but let's think about this. They're transferring a bank liability. Okay, so if they transferred bank liabilities, now all of a sudden, they, they could, they, the, the receiving bank, because they're receiving a liability, they could be in a negative, a negative equity position if they don't receive a corresponding asset. Okay, right. so what happens is that deposit goes, that's the liability of the $5, mm -hmm. but... What happens at the Fed is there's $5 of bank reserves, and that's an asset of the bank, that goes from B of A to Wells Fargo. Hmm. 
So there's two things that happen there. The liability or the deposit goes from B of A to Wells Fargo and reserves, bank reserves held at the Fed for the same amount, same $5, goes from B of A to Wells Fargo. You see, so there's, so there's a liability and an asset that, that, that moves from one bank to the other. How, think about how many times that happened. That's every single transaction hmm. that we do using a, a debit card in, in the United States or a check in the United States. So that happens, what, a, a, you know, a billion times a day, yeah. something like that. So that, it's already happening. Hmm. And, and the exact same thing would happen if we had an account with the Fed, but it would actually be a little bit easier because then there wouldn't be a corresponding liability. It would just be that asset on the Fed's balance sheet or a liability for the Fed, just going back and forth from account to an account, right? So it'd actually be easier. So then the question becomes, okay, what about the tech? You'd have to have an app on your phone that would correspond to your account with the Fed. I don't think that's very hard. <laughs> and I've got a Wells Fargo account right or app right on my phone and that pretty much corresponds. Now, yes, there's not a barcode where I can spend money directly, but I, I don't know that that would be too challenging for them. And then they just have to have a way of accepting it. And that's it. Because hmm. as far as the Fed putting, let's say $2,000 a month in every single account for stimulus or UBI or helicopter money, whatever you want to call it, um, it it's just doing the exact same thing they're already doing when they do quantitative easing and they buy a treasury from JP Morgan. And to buy that treasury, they just go to JP Morgan's reserve account with the Fed and just type in another billion dollars to pay for those <laughs> treasuries. And it would be the exact same thing that they would do for all of our accounts if they wanted to credit our accounts for UBI or stimulus or whatever they wanted to do to increase the money supply in the real economy. Because again, remember, they need to create inflation. So, so why do they need to create inflation? Because that's another way to bail out the federal government. Assuming the federal government can't generate enough tax revenue to, uh, to handle their, their debt load once it gets to a certain point, then you, they would have to have some sort of inflation because then the, it, it reduces the debt burden on the, the debtor because they can pay the debt down with devalued currency, right? So to understand that, I think it's easiest if you just take it to an extreme. If you, if you buy a house right now, and let's say you take out a $100,000 mortgage and the house is a hundred grand, let's say. Well, uh, that, now you are the debtor, just like the United States government has 27 trillion on balance sheet debt, they are the debtor, right? So same thing. So what ends up happening over 10 years, let's say we get hyperinflation. And at the end of 10 years, let's just say that you've just made interest payments or something. Let's say you still owe the $100,000 of principal that you took out at the beginning to buy the house in the first place. Well, but let's say we have this hyperinflation to now $100,000 only buys you a loaf of bread. Well, what you can do is you can basically pay off your entire loan with the same amount of money you would have paid to buy a loaf of bread. But now all of a sudden you own the house and the house, the underlying asset has the same amount of purchasing power. It can buy the same amount of goods and services that it could have purchased 10 years prior when you bought it. You see, so, so let's say the house when it was, when you bought it initially could have bought whatever, Let, let's say it could buy 100,000 loaves of bread, right? So at the end, when you pay it off, it can still buy 100,000 loaves of bread, but you paid off your debt with the equivalent of one loaf of bread. So all of those other loaves, loaves of bread was a transfer of wealth or purchasing power from the bank, from the lender to the borrower. Hmm. You see, because they're paying it back with cheaper devalued dollars. Right. And it's the exact same thing. That's why the government would like to get inflation. So when Powell comes out and says that they're moving their inflation target to 2% to a 2% average or some nonsense like this, you, and you're kind of scratching your head and you're saying to yourself, 
boy, that doesn't make any sense. Why, why do they want? Why do they want me to pay higher prices? Like, why is that a good thing? It, why, why is that a good thing if we as Americans go down to the grocery store and every time we go to the grocery store, the bill's higher? How does that make us richer? Right? Well, it doesn't. The only thing it does is bail out the government because they're paying those, their their nominal debt back with with cheaper dollars. Hmm. See, so so again, my my point is is that's another way that they could create inflation, which the government has to have in order to maintain this this charade and to continue to kick the can down the road. Hmm. So what you're saying here is it's very possible that legal tender will be loaves of bread in the near future. And we'll go into the bank and making it. Not, uh, not, not, not necessarily. <laughs> I'm that, just making but, a joke. Yeah, not necessarily that, but uh, you know, like when I go down to Columbia, I spend a lot of time there and uh, a common uh, bill uh, is, as a 50,000 peso bill. Okay. Well that buys you, buys you lunch, right? But, but think about that. I mean, when, when Columbia, when they set up the, the peso in the first place, did they start off by saying, okay, well, we want lunch to cost 50,000 pesos. Did we just like all these zeros on here for no reason at all? No, of course not. It started off as a five. And they added another zero, 50. Now they added another zero, 500. Now it's 5,000. You see where that goes? Now it's 50,000, but it still just buys you lunch. So what has to happen? What do you think has to happen for them to get to that position? I mean, I thought that they would use the. I thought they would say, "Your coronavirus spreads on dollars, so we have to immediately make them illegal for public health." That's mm-hmm. what I thought was going to happen. It didn't. Uh, what do you think has to happen to get to that to to this stage that you're talking about there? I think there's several things they can do. And, and unfortunately, I think that we're going to bring it upon ourselves. Like we're going to want it. Hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, as an example, I, I was looking at my Twitter feed today and the people on my Twitter feed are, are very, uh, you know, very libertarian. They, they don't want, they don't like the Fed. Most of them, they you know, <laughs> want the free market capitalism. And I was talking about the, the Banking for All Act uh, getting around the commercial banking system and potentially putting the banks out of business. And this individual responded to, to one of my tweets. He says, oh, that's fantastic. We need to get rid of the banksters. Hmm. I'm like, no, 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 no. Be careful what you wish for, my friend. You know, you're, you're going from the, the frying pan into the fire. And so I, I think that, or, or let's look at it from a standpoint of stimulus, that's what I was going to say. It's an interesting problem reaction solution when a bunch of people don't have jobs. You can, and everyone, you know, online, I mean, you see people that are normally con- fiscally conservative that are basically begging for money right now. Yeah, right. Right. So you say, okay, if you want your stimulus check, well, you just have to download the, the Fed app. And then we're just going to set up this awesome, super cool, convenient bank account for you with the Fed. Oh, fantastic. Great. <laughs> How do I sign up? Yeah. You know, there's going to be no connecting the dots saying, wait a minute, if the Fed has my bank account, all my information, then it could lead to this, this, this and this. Like like people, all they see is just free money and like, OK, what do I need to do to get it? OK, done. That's what I'm going to do to get my free money. And so I, I think that uh, and then, of course, at some point, I, I think you're right in principle Maybe they're not going to say we're going to ban cash because it's dirty, but whatever they, whatever excuse they use to ban cash, it's going to be for your safety. It's always for your safety. That's how they get everything through. I well, guess they could even it, say the drug want- dealers are using it, the terrorists are using it, and for your own safety, yeah. we're going to ban cash, or for your own convenience. And at, at a certain point. People are just going to be like, yeah, it's a no brainer. Why do we need this stupid cash? I don't, I don't want it. And here, take it. And then they give it back to the bank. The bank sends it to, to, sends it to the fed and then the fed just incinerates it. And then, you know, and it might not happen overnight. Yeah. It might be something like, um, you know, like we use change now. I mean, very few people, I mean, you get change every once in a while, but you kind of throw it in a bag. You don't really use it too often. You know, you don't carry around in your pocket. And maybe it's just gradual progression that we use less and less and less and less cash until we get to a point where we're like, okay, we're done. 
and maybe that's two or three years. But I, I think once the politicians start to think it through and understand how much power this gives them, I, I think you're going to see the progression happen a lot faster. And if you look at the agenda that the World Economic Forum has, I mean, a lot of it's kind of digital currency based, but of course they don't want anything that's decentralized like Bitcoin. They want the complete opposite of that. They, they want the something that's totally centralized that they would control and be able to micromanage. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, I could talk to you for nine hours about it and I want to be super <laughs> respectful of your, of your time, you know, maybe, uh, if you enjoyed it, we could have you yeah, back on. And we sure. have we have Rick and Doug Casey are both coming on once a month, and it'd be awesome to have someone like you to come on once a month and and give us some some updates. But um, while I'd love to, I mean, just between you and I, I'd love to keep going more and more into that. It's so fascinating, and you're you know you you really are an an incredible thinker, and it's very valuable what you're doing. I'm glad that your work went online. It's thank you help a lot of people, but. Let me ask you kind of in conclusion, although, like I said, uh, I'd love to not make a conclusion, but I want to be respectful of your time. So let me ask you, you hear all this and we can go into some more questions. I have a million of them that I wish I could ask now, but I'll save them for next time. So let's wrap up with like uh, preparedness. Um, you hear all this and, you know, there's two crowds, in my opinion, there's a crowd that theoretically talks about this, but it is from purely almost like a, um, it's almost from a uh, information porn perspective where it's like, wow, 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 fascinating, fascinating. But then there's like somebody like you that's sharing it, but you have a, an investing background, a business background, and you can help a lot of people, whether it's people in their 20s like myself or someone in their 60s. What would you say are the ways that we can prepare ourselves for, I don't even know the word, but basically it's a, it's a reverse global meltdown. Uh, mm -hmm. How do we prepare for it in, con in, in conclusion? And I'm sure you could talk for 10 hours about just being prepared, but w what would you say in conclusion to someone listening, um, whether it's from a budgeting perspective or a business perspective or an investing perspective, what are some things that someone listening to this could say, wow, George just like blew my mind right there and I want to take some next steps? Let me just keep it very simple. I mean, what people can do is they can own a little bit of gold or silver. I always suggest about 10% of your portfolio in physical gold because this, everything we've talked about, gold is going to hedge this. You know, not Maybe not fully, but it's going to be a, a pretty darn solid hedge. So I say you, you buy gold not really to get rich, but to stay rich to maintain your purchasing power. So that would be first and foremost. Uh, another thing that everyone or most people can do that own a home is just make sure that your mortgage is 30 year fixed rate. Because going back to the example we use there, you're going to benefit from the inflation that the government needs. So if the Fed bails out the Fed or the Fed bails out the government through this inflation that we talked about, if they can do it, which I think eventually they'll, they'll figure out a way, but you will be the beneficiary of that because you're, you're aligning your interests with the government. And I don't like to say that because I'm as libertarian as they come, but you, know, you, you might as well profit from it. You might as well increase your purchasing power. You might as well be prepared. So if you can lock in a mortgage rate right now for 30 years at let's say 3% and inflation starts running at, call it 10%, well, the difference between the two, that 7%, is going to be additional purchasing power you have. It'll be a transfer of wealth from the bank to you. You'll be making money on that. You'll be increasing your purchasing power. So that, that's just two very, very simple things that I think most people listening to this can actually do. Now, if you want to take it a step further, and maybe you're a little more sophisticated investor, you've got a, a portfolio, uh, maybe you have a 401k, I would seriously analyze your 401k and ask yourself, if you, if you have this typical 60-40 portfolio, this risk parity portfolio, you, you need to be very careful because uh, you, you got to look at the bond side of your portfolio. And again, if we want to buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're expensive, 
And we know that interest rates and the price of a bond have an inverse relationship. So the lower the interest rate, the higher the price of the bond. And if we know, which we do, that interest rates are at 5,000 year lows, that means that bond prices are at 5,000 year highs. <laughs> Nothing cheap about that. <laughs> that is expensive. So you gotta keep, you know, that might be 60% of your portfolio and, and your financial advisor is sitting there telling you that that's the part of your portfolio that's quote unquote safe. There's nothing safe about that at all. That's wildly risky, especially when you've got a Fed that's trying to create inflation, which theoretically will decrease the value of your bonds because that will move interest rates up or can, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so then you look at the other side, you say, oh, thank goodness, at least I have these equities. Okay, okay let's look at equities. Let's look, let's look at something called the Buffett indicator. I like it a lot. It's, it's just the overall market cap of the stock market compared to GDP. So you, you'd think there should be a relationship there, right? Because the, the, the GDP is reflecting the businesses and the corporations that are within the real economy that actually have sales. And the stock price should be reflected by how much profit or how many sales those businesses are actually making in the real economy. That's not the case anymore. So what we see back in the 1970s and 1980s is, and if you look at a chart of this, you can see it just by Googling it, that the, the, uh, the nominal GDP was higher than the market cap. Hmm. But then it kind of got to this one point where the market cap exceeded GDP. First time was 2000, dot-com bubble. Hmm. But it barely went above GDP. Just, just, you can see it on a chart. Then the next time it went above GDP, meaning the, the, the uh, market cap was 2007. And it went up just a little bit more, okay? Well, now look at a chart. I mean, if there was this much of a difference in 2002, maybe this much of a difference in 2007, now <laughs> there's like 10 feet of difference. And not only that, what's really frightening about the chart is you see that this is the only time in history, and, and the chart I'm looking at only goes back to 1970. So, but I doubt it occurred uh, prior to that, especially when we were on a gold standard or a quasi gold standard. So, but this is the only time going back to let's say 1970 for sure that the GDP has just fallen off a cliff. I mean, it has gone straight down as a result of obviously the the virus and whatnot and the lockdowns while at the same time, the market cap has gone straight up. <laughs> They've completely diverged to where one's going this way, one's going parabolic, and one's falling off a cliff, doing a wild E. Coyote. So you've got to ask yourself, okay, do I really want to own something that is supposed to be a reflection of the economy, but now has no relationship to the economy whatsoever? And just like bonds, as a, is at an all-time high price. I mean, my simple answer would be no. And then you think about what the other, the other part of their net worth most likely is. Uh, the, the, if you think about the their whole uh, portfolio, if you think about their entire net worth, most likely they've got a high percentage of that net worth in 401k, what we just talked about. And the other percentage of their net worth is most likely their home equity. Yeah. Okay. Let's look, at a, let's look at a chart of housing prices adjusted for inflation going back to 1900. Prices, all time high. So you've got 100% of your net worth in assets that are at all time highs. And, and, you're, and you're thinking you're, you're 70, year old, 70 years old and you need to retire, that needs to last the rest of your life. And you're basically invested in three things that are the equivalent of the tulip bubble. So, so that is the, the furthest thing from safe. So then you ask the question, okay, well, what is cheap? Maybe I want to divest, maybe I want to sell what's expensive. So I sell my bonds, sell my stocks, sell uh, the real estate potentially. What's cheap? Commodities. Hmm. Commodities are cheap. So oil is cheap. Coal is cheap. Um, uranium, copper, 
these things are, are, are very cheap. The gold miners, the silver miners, especially when you compare them to M2 money supply right, or, or the Fed's balance sheet or base money. So these are things that's cheap. And I'm not saying go all in. You, you got to have a diversified portfolio. That's for sure. But the way I like to set up my portfolio personally is have that 10% allocation to gold. Then I like to allocate 10% of it to speculation. So those are things that I just feel as though there's asymmetry. So Bitcoin might be a good example of that. Or the gold miners would be a good example of that. Uranium would be a good example of that. And then 80% of my portfolio, I like to have in an asset that, or multiple assets that pay me to own them. That's how I define investments. Hmm. So that would be like an oil producer that's paying a very nice dividend. Maybe a coal you know, miner. Most people don't like that because they think it's going down with energy, but that, they, they forget that steel is made from coal. So, uh, you know, you got a great dividend there. You're just buying the cash flow, basically. Hmm. And so uh, that, that would be an example there, maybe a foreign bond. So even if you're not right, it doesn't really matter too much because you're still just collecting the cash flow hmm. and you're buying that cash flow when it's cheap. Uh, one thing I think people should, should, and maybe this can be the main takeaway from uh, this last part of the segment, is that if you go back to 1968, what's the best performing stock in the entire stock market? What do you think? I don't know. Altria. Huh. What is that? They make cigarettes. Oh, really? Interesting. They make cigarettes. And then what's the best performing sector since the mid-1990s? tobacco. Hmm. So why is it, why did it perform so well? Because they're cash cows. They just pay these massive dividends and they just keep paying them and paying them and paying them and paying them. And although the stock price doesn't, you know, doesn't do a Tesla or something huh. like that, just gradually, 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 it's the turtle that wins the race. The people take all this cash that they're getting, they reinvest the dividends. And if you do that compounded over time, Next thing you know, you got the greatest performing stock since 1968. And by the way, a lot of the tobacco stocks right now are paying eight, nine percent dividends. Hmm. So I, I, I would readjust my thinking that way and uh, hopefully be able to make some better decisions and be more prepared for what uh, could be coming down the pipeline in the future. Very interesting. So uh, truly appreciate it. Couple quick, just yes or no or true, false. Do you think true, false, uh, you see these cash flow with, with the balance sheets of gold and silver miners particularly, you know, are looking more and more plush, especially the producers particularly with where the price is going and, uh, and of course a fixed cost. So it's just, cash on cash on cash as the price keeps going up. Do you think that that has a potential over the next 10 years to, you know, maybe be a mini version of that cigarette stock in that they're so plush with cash that you could see? Uh, I mean, you already are seeing great dividend hikes in them, ir irrespective to what's happening in the rest of the market. Sure. But do you think it has that potential? True. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it has potential, may, maybe not to be as consistent over the long term, but I yeah. also think it has the potential to go up a lot faster and a lot quicker, uh, especially with, with silver or maybe, so I know there's not a really a direct play on the silver miners, but uh, you know, something like that, I think is very interesting. So I, I definitely answer true to that question. Interesting. So uh, let me ask you one thing you're excited about or grateful for right now in your life. It's my last question. I always like to ask everybody, what's something you're excited or grateful for? Oh, my life, <laughs> my life. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm look at the way I live my life. I retired at 38 years old. I was a self-made millionaire at 34. I, I've traveled to over 40 countries. I literally am at a place and I have been for over a decade where I, I go where I want, when I want, and how I want to get there. And, uh, you know, most people don't have that type of freedom and flexibilities. I'm incredibly fortunate to have the life uh, that I have, and, and I don't ever forget that. Amazing. I'd love to get more into that next time. Next time we talk, that's, uh, that's fantastic. I'd love to break down how you were able to retire at 38. So I truly appreciate it, George, for everyone listening. Be sure to hit the like button on either side and be sure to leave a comment with a question down below that maybe you'd love 
for George to discuss next time we come back on. And, and if, and if George wants to come back on, I'll pull the questions for everybody to be able to add some input at the end of the interview next time. So leave a question down below and we'll put all the links to all of George's great work in the description.